shut up compressor. Okay, so what do I think is coming next in the hobby? I mean, honestly, earlier in the year I probably could have given you a pretty confident answer, but with COVID-19 fucking everything up, with wingnut wings suddenly shutting, I don't know. Um, I, I think there are some definite trends that are taking things in interesting directions, but I don't know when or how they will exactly come to pass. So let's talk about a couple of them. Uh, first of all, 3D printing. So 3D printing is definitely starting to make its presence felt in the hobby. I know that various manufacturers out there are already using 3D master, 3D printed masters for resin aftermarket. And there are a few places that are even going beyond that and just selling 3D printed stuff as aftermarket now. Um, Flying Leathernecks actually just developed a GBU 38 and I think a GBU 32? I have to go back and look. Um, that are 3D printed, fantastically gorgeous. The uh, the 38 even has like a separate nose cage, so you can paint that without masking all the shit, which is awesome. Uh, I see a lot more of that coming down the pipe, especially as the resolution of 3D printers gets better and better and better. What I don't necessarily see is people selling stuff that you print at home. Uh, why is that? I think mainly because quality control is a huge issue and so I know you know people who have like I have a 3d printer that I honestly haven't even pulled out of the fucking box because it intimidates me so much and I just don't have the time to devote to figuring it out then it's hot as shit um, you know and my, my forays into fusion 360 were failures because I again I just do not have the time to sit and learn it and develop the vision to figure out how to make things work uh, but what I what I do see is more and more aftermarket manufacturers taking advantage of it, um, being able to spin out stuff quickly without having to necessarily commit to like massive production runs. So you might even see stuff like available for longer, which would be really nice. Uh, but anyway, I think that is kind of where that's going. So it's going to be a cottage industry that is going to increasingly displace resin. And I think we'll open up some interesting new categories for detailing. So the, uh, you know, the knobs and switches from, uh, from Annie's that I dude I, I apologize for constantly butchering your name um, you know the knobs and switches and toggles and things like that amazingly useful um, I, th I think we're going to see more of that sort of a thing I think we're going to see you know, hyper realistic weapons, ordnance um, 3D printed figures like it's going to give a lot more options to sort of that cottage industry of what we can actually see coming out of it But and between honestly 3D printing and e-commerce, I don't see that stuff dying off at all. I see it exploding. I mean, even in the last two years, I've seen more new aftermarket providers come online than I think existed total in 2010. So, kudos. It's awesome to see. Um, but, I, yeah, I don't see that extending into, like, download a kit and print it at home. I, Again, the quality control is not there. And until it is, I don't think that's going to happen. And I think what you will have, what you will have, is sort of like a maker community, for lack of a better term, of people who can actually design shit and who are willing to kind of post it up for sale. But at the same time, I think you're just as likely to see those people maybe reaching out directly to some of those aftermarket companies and maybe like licensing their design and getting a small cut of whatever the same, you know, various options like that. Uh, beyond that kits. Um, I think 132nd scale is a bit stagnant right now, to be honest. Uh, Tamiya has not dropped a new tool 132nd scale kit since the Mosquito a couple, well, it's probably like several years ago now, right? Um, is that 2017, maybe? And I don't know when they're going to do another one. I really hope they are. I would love them to do a 132nd Thunderbolt at some point. Um, but they seem not interested in that game right now. And Trumpeter's kind of been lagging, and the stuff they've been dropping has been 
iffy. Um, so I really don't know what's happening in that scale, especially with Wingnut Wings now out of the picture. Who fucking knows? Um, which is a shame, because there, there has been some great stuff. Uh, 148th, I see really kind of doing one of those things where what were the top dog kits are getting plowed under by new kits now, so you know, in the past couple years we've had a really solid new F-104, we've got Edward dropping, you know, their late Mark Spitfires a few years ago, and now the Mustang, um, they're kind of the, you know, king of the hill for most 109s, except for the G6, which I think Tamiya takes them, takes them on. I see all that kind of stuff kind of continuing, I see a lot of uh, interesting stuff coming out of like the Great Wall hobbies of the world, or in the you know in the European side, I think Edward is still doing really interesting stuff. I think uh, you know Zvezda and ICM and the various like Russian manufacturers have a lot of promise, but they also have a lot of inconsistency. So I kind of want to see that improve. Um, but kit maker is going to kit make, so there's going to be new shit coming out all over the place. Uh, in terms of decals and masking. Whew. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see more aftermarket masking products becoming a thing. I wouldn't be surprised to see more and more people having masking cutters at home. Uh, it's just super useful. At the same time, I think decals are still a thing. I think uh, in the next year or two, we're going to see HTW no longer be the one manufacturer of wet transfers. I think somebody else is going to th realize, fuck, that's awesome, and start doing it themselves. Coffee break. Uh, and I think we're going to see a couple things that are just going to kind of blow our minds. Like, where the fuck did that come from? Like, uh, you know, a good example is Quinta Modeling Studios. They're making these 3D decals for cockpits that are basically like the whole fucking console. Knobs and switches raised and everything. Um, you know, pretty beautifully colored, at least from what the photos look like. I actually should probably order a set to see what they look like in person. But instead of the typical, you know, photo edge try to stack shit so it's like has a little bit of depth to it as opposed to being completely flat these have depth already um gluing is not an issue because they're decals and they look really interesting so i think we're going to see stuff like that where people find new ways of approaching this stuff that we hadn't thought of or that i mean fuck i don't even know how they pull that off like is that are they 3d printing stuff onto it like decal paint like I, I don't know what i don't even know how it's happening so um yeah i think we're gonna see more of that stuff i think uh we're going to see more, I would say, bespoke photo etch and aftermarket. So, in the past, a kit would come out from Tamiya, from Hasegawa, from Ravel, from Italeri, whoever. And sure enough, within about a year, you would have everybody drop aftermarket for it. So, you would have stuff from Aries and Quick Boost, which are the same thing. You would have Edward Photo Etch. You would have... You know, whoever the fuck is making wheels, making wheels for it. You would have all these, you know, all the aftermarket stuff kind of like land in a clump. And then you would have everything you needed. Uh, nowadays, that's not happening. So, how long has Italeri's F-35 been out? Quite a while, right? Uh, I think it's two years at this point, something like that. You still can't get a seat. You still can't get a resin aftermarket seat for it. You just can't. Uh, you can get wheels. Cool. Um... Uh, you know, just things like that. Like, I, I think we're seeing the aftermarket companies, at least the big ones, um, really focusing their guns on the kits that they know, or the, the subjects that they know they can sell multiple rounds of things of, or ordnance that can apply to a bunch of different things, so it's not tied specifically to a kit. Um, but that also means that there are some kits out there that just don't have aftermarket support. Uh, and one thing I think will not happen, even though I want it to, we will not see any aftermarket low-vis decals for 132nd Skyhawks because for some reason they don't exist and it seems like a curse because I've got an A4M sitting over here that I want to build uh, in low-vis and shit all has happened. So, maybe one day. So I think one of the more groan-worthy aspects of this hobby is the just absolute shitty way that a lot of modelers talk about their significant others. Uh, it's literally even got an acronym of SWIMBO, she who must be obeyed. And this, this idea of grown-ass men sneaking kits past their wives so they don't get 
henpecked and nagged to death over their hobby purchases. And this is something that I've always found really pretty sad and depressing. I know it's intended as like a ha ha ha, you know, the old wife won't let me do anything. But holy shit, come on. Like, that is not how healthy relationships work at all. Um, you know, I mean, my wife isn't the most enamored with my hobby. She rolls her eyes when I kind of go off on rants about Mustangs and things like that. But at the same time, she's happy that I'm doing it and, you know, happy that I find that I find value in it and that I seem to derive personal benefit from it. So, great. Just like I'm happy that she enjoys her hobbies. And that's really the way it should be. And if, honestly, if hobby purchases become a financial issue within the household, that's something that y'all need to sit down and talk about together and kind of maybe figure out like a weekly or a monthly budget for hobbies and how much you can spend on them. Um, and of course, give each other a bit of grace if sometimes that spending goes a little bit over because we're human. Uh, 2020 is a hellscape of a year and hobbies are probably one of the few things keeping a lot of us sane right now. So yeah, basically, don't complain about your wife because it makes you look like a whiny piece of shit. So, how can you make decal film disappear every time? Now, before I dive into this, I should probably give a few caveats. The first is, I actually recorded this answer a few nights ago, or I thought I did. I actually forgot to hit record on the, uh, on the damn camera here. So basically, I just talked at the thing for a few minutes, and nothing got saved. Oops. Uh, second, I've had my share of decal foibles in the past, which I take as learning experiences, but also I would say they make me probably not the expert to go to for all things decals. Uh, basically, I fumble around in the dark, much like everybody else does, and try to get along as best I can, and I've kind of gotten to a point where I have a certain set of things that work well, and I'm open to other things, I'm open to other experiments, but I'm also in a little bit of a happy place at the moment, so take that for what you will. Now, hiding decal film basically has three components, or three factors to to be concerned about. So the first one is silvering, the second one is the sheen of the decal carrier film itself, and the third is the thickness of the carrier film. And each one of them requires its own little special things. So let's talk about silvering first. So what causes silvering? Well, it is not unevenness in the surface. Uh, I can point to plenty of examples of pretty people putting decals down on fucking sandpaper and having it settle in nicely or putting decals over Zimmerit on German tanks. A little slight rough texture on your flat aircraft wing is not what's causing the silvering. The general consensus, I think, as is, is best as can be worked out, is that what's happening with silvering is a failure of decal adhesive. So basically, underneath all the other shit of a decal, you have a layer of adhesive, something like cornstarch or similar. And when you wet the decal, it loosens that up so you can slide it off the sheet, put it on your model, and then it will adhere down problem is sometimes with old decal sheets the adhesive has degraded sometimes in your efforts to manipulate the thing around and get it flat and all that you squeegee all the adhesive out and it just kind of lifts anyway and things like that so to fight that uh, basically what I have started using is this Tamiya decal adhesive softener type basically in lieu of something like micro set um, or Mr. Mark's setter or whatnot. And it literally has an adhesive in it, so it will fill all the holes that an adhesive has. And when I was doing my jug build, and I was testing the really, really super goddamn shitty Aeromaster decals, trying to find a way to make them work, like, a lot of these in here are just garbage. Like, you know, that, that UN right there, you can see where it just didn't settle down. We've got some fun silvering on this N over here. All of that is just straight up adhesive failure. And when I started using the Tamiya stuff, and also honestly the VMS 2-in-1 gets a good mark, it also has an adhesive thing in it as well. So I used those back here, like on this UN. And while these decals had massive problems settling into shit, um, they actually, you know, all the silvering issues went away. So use the right materials to basically ensure that that's not going to happen. And I would also re also recommend whatever decal sheet you're using, whatever subject you're working on, take a spare decal or three and put them on a test mule and make sure that everything is working the way that you want it to work. 
because honestly, I don't trust decals at all. And from sheet to sheet, even of the same sheet from the same decal manufacturer or decal printer, or whatever you want to call them, I, I don't trust it. So verify what's happening before you move in. If you feel like you're going to risk silvering at all, pick up a bottle of this stuff or that VMS stuff. It's fantastic. And that will help reduce that side of things. Next, we have the whole issue of decal sheen. So say you put down a glossy decal on a flat surface, or you put down a flat decal on a glossy surface, and all of a sudden, oh shit, sheen difference, it shows up. That's what clear coats are for. Um, there are a few clear coats you probably want to avoid putting on top of decals too heavily. You know, Gunge GX100 is pretty hot. If you're gonna put it on top of something, light misted coats. Uh, same for some of the MRP clears, especially their earlier clears. They've definitely improved over the years because they kind of reformulated a bit. But you can see, like on, for example, this HV here, you know, we have sheen variants on a lot of these that didn't get sprayed, like back here, where things just all fucked up. This did get sprayed with, a, it actually got sprayed with a MO One Shot Transparent Primer, which is essentially a really thick, curly clear, and uh, just it vanished it. Did a great job. So for sheen variants, do that. Now the last fun, the last one that is uh, super fun is carrier film thickness. So this is a mostly notable in kit decal. Like the decal is actually included with kits. Um, I think because manufacturers don't want to worry about casual builders tearing decals, so they'd rather err on the side of thickness, right? And that's great and all until you start spraying clear coats over it. And you can still see the outline of the carrier film because it's, you know, it's just high enough that it forms a ridge. So, pretty much the best way to get rid of this entirely is to spray a gradual buildup of some sort of heavy-bodied clear. For this, I do use GX100. Which, where the fuck did it go? GX100. So, spray it, spray it, spray it, spray it. Build up a layer of it over the decal, and then very gently come in and sand it down. Um, I would recommend wet sanding so you, you know, can see, you know, you can manage better. You have a lower chance of scuffing up the paint, all that kind of stuff. But eventually you get to a point where it flattens it out and instead of having, you know, like a little stair step like that with the decal, it's more of like a smooth thing like this, at least, you know, on like a microscopic level, right? So I actually did this uh, most recently, I think, with my trumpeter dauntless build where tr trumpeters hamilton standard prop stencils were just terrible uh, as most of their logo stencils tend to be so i stole a pair from or not a pair i stole three from a tamiya corsair kit and dropped those on it and sure enough tamiya decals nice and thick left the step got in there sprayed the gx100 sprayed it again and again and again sanded it down and got a nice smooth finish where the decals were nicely you know worked into the actual surface of the prop so that's my recommendation for that now you also have a few other options you can go to to avoid carrier film altogether so if it's a subject that happens to have hgw wet transfers made for it pick some of those up they basically work sort of like uh temporary tattoos i would say so you put the decal that you know you treat it like a decal except i think you have to use mr mark software or, you know, some sort of decal setting solution. So you put that down on the surface, right? Wait six to eight hours, you come back, pair of tweezers, a scalpel, whatever, peel up the carrier film, and just peel it away. And you're left with just the actual printed stuff on the surface. Great things. Uh, Edward apparently is doing something similar-ish with their newer decal sheets, like the ones in the VLR Mustang and the Spitfire Mark I. Apparently this is something that was more of a bug that they just happened to kind of catch and turn into a feature, sort of on an unofficial level. But basically the same thing. You put them down, you wait, and you can come back and peel up the carrier film, and you have a nice, smooth, carrierless decal in place. So those are the options. Um, another one, if you want to go crazy, is just make your own masks and print them on, print them on vinyl with something like a Silhouette or a Cricut. Uh, I use... Oracal or Oramask 810. It's my preferred vinyl. Basically do that, pull off the vinyl, put it down on something, mask it off, paint it, remove the mask, you're good to go. Uh, you never have to worry about decal shit, and you can do fun things like fading and all that with the actual colors you're spraying with. So 
those are basically my general tips to avoid and get rid of carrier film every time, with the caveat that sometimes they will probably still find a way to fuck you because decals are the worst. <clears throat> okay, this is a real quick insert to the whole decal thing that I forgot to really touch on while I was filming it, but when I was working on the Great Wall Hobby SU-35 and had my various decal issues, one of the things I didn't realize as I was working on it, because the surface was pretty smooth, is that the decals were thick as shit. And you can actually see it here on the Judd paint mule. So down here, I put down, you know, various um, board numbers just to essentially test them, right? And I believe they are 24, yeah. So here's one and here's another one. They have since been covered by layers of paint and you can still see the outline of the numbers, you can still see the outline of the carrier film and everything. So that's why you wanna make sure that you're using decals that ideally have pretty thin carrier film and you wanna be careful to make sure that you are taking some pains if you're working with thick decals to blend them into the surface. So I swear, probably about once a week, someone somewhere on the modeling internet posts something to the effect of, why are all the models these days so weathered, blah, 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 I don't like weathering, a crew chief would never let this happen, blah, 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 blah. And there is an inevitable dogpile on weathering with people claiming that models are over-weathered. And man, is it tedious. <laughs> I feel like this is uh, something I've been railing against since I came back to the hobby. But let's dig into it a little bit, shall we? So, first of all, aircraft, tanks, ships, things like that, they weather. There are all kinds of reference photos that prove that they weather. You know, the idea that a plane in World War II would not have been in service long enough to get dirty, complete bullshit. That a Sherman tank in the Ardennes would not get dirty, complete bullshit. You know, I mean, there are reference photos galore, like this one, and this one, and this one, and this one too, and also this one. Now, if someone's just stating a preference or an opinion, you know, weathering is not their thing. Cool. Fine. Great. I don't like mushrooms. I also honestly find clean, completely clean schemes, completely clean finishes, boring as shit. That doesn't mean that I won't acknowledge that they do exist. There are plenty of clean aircraft out there. There are also plenty of dirty ones. It's just a preference thing. What galls me is when it tumbles from opinion into proclamation or statement of fact. That like, well, a crew chief would never do this. A crew chief would never let that happen. Incorrect. <laughs> um... It's that, that sort of uh, gatekeeping, I know the only truth, etc. thing that honestly is probably one of the bigger detriments to the hobby out there these days. Uh, it just, it, it dispirits people and drives people away. So, fucking stop it. Now, if we want to talk about overweathering, I don't really know that overweathering is such a thing that exists because, first of all, there is a huge spectrum of different kinds of weathering. Are you talking about rust? Are you talking about chipping? Are you talking about, you know, mud and rain marks and other environmental effects? Are you talking about exhaust staining, gun staining, paint fade? Like, what are we talking about? There's all different kinds of weathering. There's also all different kinds of degrees of weathering. I mean, you can look at pretty much any P-51 from any point in World War II, and it's going to show some weathering somewhere on it. It could be some exhaust staining, it could be, um, you know, scuffing and wear and tear on the silver paint on the wings. It could be fluid leaks, it could, you know, all kinds of stuff. Some of them are going to be dirtier than others. It's just, hey, airplanes flying all over the place, you know, if you're flying off of some Ford base in Belgium in December of 1944 with primitive facilities, your plane's probably going to get a little bit dirtier than when it's flying around a nice babied facility out in England in the summertime, right? Seems to make sense. So, 
there's that whole gamut. I think where the idea of overweathered comes in is where it's maybe not so much that as it is inappropriate weathering um, or just kind of slathering stuff on with no regard to really how a thing actually weathers in the real world. So this could be something like all of the wing is filthy and dirty as opposed to where it typically gathers, which is in the wing roots and where people move and it kind of lessens out towards the wingtips because the wingtips are not in the flow of exhaust gases. They're not in the, you know, they're not in places where people walk and where their boots kind of scuff the paint, etc. cetera. Um, but still, I feel like overweathering is just such a bullshit term. It, no, um, I would rather focus more on inaccurate weathering and weathering that's not really supported by any references that exist. So inaccurate weathering would be things that just, I would consider aren't physically possible. Um, you're never going to have fabric surfaces chipping down to bare metal. You're never gonna have wood that rusts, etc. cetera. It just, it's, not a, it's just not a thing. It's like saying that your toast melted. The toast doesn't melt. Well, probably if you like threw it into the sun, it would melt, but you know, the temperatures to get bread to a liquid state are pretty freaking high. And by that point, it would probably just be reduced to like carbon anyway, and etc. So I definitely think there is a thing where there is inaccurate weathering, but that doesn't make it over weathering. It just makes it wrong. There's also weathering that's just not supported by any sources that we can find or that's not well supported. So for example, <clears throat> a common thing you'll see on a lot of models is little skid marks coming back down the wings from the gun ports and the leading edges. Not really a thing on the upper surfaces, uh, mainly because of the way that airflow works, where there's literally like a boundary layer of air on the top there. And so anything that comes out of the leading edge just gets shot up over the wing. So you'll have, you know, powder stains and stuff along the leading edge of the wing itself, maybe like right by the, right by the actual barrels of the guns if they are flush with the wing or like just slightly slightly protruding but you're not going to have these big little skid marks going back along it the underside is completely different the underside has air hitting it and lifting it the whole time like this and so anything that comes out and goes underneath is going to contact the lower side and that's why if you look at you know there's some great photos of like hellcats and things like that where the underside of the wing is just i mean it, it looks like uh they didn't wipe basically and it's just completely filthy. So the little dainty skid marks on the upper surface, not really realistic. The little dainty ones on the bottom should probably be heavier. But I mean, I think ultimately the thing to keep in mind is that a lot of the aircraft, I, I tend to focus on aircraft because that's what I build most of and I'm most familiar with from a weathering standpoint. The aircraft that we're building get dirty. They just do. And understanding how they get dirty and studying reference photos and reading accounts and talking to people who have direct experience with the things is really useful to understand what's going on. I'm like, there's a great photo I've got of an intruder, since I'm actually working on one right now, where the refueling probe, you know, the big old thing that sticks up in front of the canopy, the top of it is just covered in gunk, like basically excess fuel as it pulls away from the little basket that it's refueling from, spills and gets all over it. And if you look down at the base of the probe where it actually, you know, seats in just in front of the windscreen, you can see like little spatters of shit all over the place, except directly in the line of where it sits. And where it sits, it's completely clean. And so that means that as it's refueling and that little spray of gas goes out, it's just like if you sprayed something with a hose and you held up like, you know, a book or something and the book would get wet, but the thing behind the book whatever it would be, the surface would stay dry. It's the exact same thing. And it's, it's like, oh, that's a pretty cool little weathering thing. I can't wait to try to work that into the intruder I'm working with. Um, you know, it's, those little things really bring it to life and I think respect what the thing was doing at the time that it got so dirty, uh, which I think helps tell a really cool story about a particular aircraft, a particular tank, etc. And there's one more factor to consider with weathering, and that's drama. So there's no one clear true way to paint models there's just not i mean i know that you know the ipms concepts here in the u.s they tend to favor clean schemes and things like that which is weird because even in the rules it doesn't say that but that's tend to be the way it works out um, 
but there's no one true path. There's everything from like the really boring ass Hasegawa box style where it's just it's green, green, like all the way to the far end where you have you know really out there things like cell shading making it look like anime or you have the more aggressive stuff of the Spanish school where it's bringing in different color elements to really just hype or not hype but pump up the intensity of the thing make it more saturated more colorful and therefore more dramatic I think all of those are equally valid based on what you want to do it's more sort of what you want to do and how well you can carry off your vision and I think what happens with a lot of weathering is a lot of weathering is used and I do this myself to intentionally add a bit of drama to the proceedings so the weathering may be more contrasted than you might typically see or it might be a bit heavier than you might typically see again to add drama to make it more visually interesting and I don't think there's anything wrong with that I think that comes down to how you like to build and paint you know I mean you think about a gear bay or something you know or a wing or something like that and you get in close and you look at the actual like reference photos and they're pretty dirty right so you get in there and you focus and you just like okay I've got this shot of like this is what this joint to the gear strut looks like right here I'm gonna recreate that exactly and you recreate that exactly and then you zoom out and it's gone and you don't see it because it's so subtle at that further distance that it falls apart and it just kind of blends into everything else so with weathering as I would say also with like shading you should, hell, you see this on like every fucking figure that gets painted but I would say you know shading especially in darker areas like gear bays or cockpits pumping up that contrast almost giving it like a stage makeup thing just to make it more noticeable also applies to weathering uh, you know in my 132nd p47 I actually focused on this because it's the thing where you know you think oh the cockpit's all weathered and you close it up and it's like I can't see a damn thing so with that one I actually intentionally went way overboard on it you know it's like very very light light dust with very dark stains in there from like you know mud and fluid tracked in from boots and like oh the boot around the control stick is leaking something so there's a little st you know, a little stain on the soft the side of it and it actually kind of showed up um, so I think that that's another thing that has to be taken into consideration when you're thinking about over weathering is maybe it's not that maybe it is weathering that is emphasized intentionally so that it actually shows up 